The work the SAG Foundation is doing is enormously important. From the up and coming actors to the veterans like myself, the Foundation is here to help all of us. As fellow artists, we've all been there. It's crucial that we remember where we came from and help out however we can. For over 25 years, the SAG Foundation has been the industry's best kept secret, and we're out to change that. As natural storytellers, it's great that we have the opportunity to give back through the children's literacy program. A disaster like Sandy really brings it home with how crucial the SAG Foundation is. Their donation drive helped so many people in need. The seminars and workshops are crucial. Working together is what makes us better. The SAG Foundation is a nonprofit organization that relies solely on donations to keep these important programs free for everyone. The SAG Foundation can't do it alone. We need you. If you need help, ask. If you can help, give. We're all in this together. 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 Together, everyone benefits. Join the cause. Back now. Good evening again. My name is Dennis Baker. I'm the Life Ramp Program Director. Thanks, guys, for coming in the audience. Thanks you for everyone watching on the live stream. One quick announcement. We are trying to be social media conscious, which means we're on Facebook and Twitter. We ask that you follow and like us because you can gain information about upcoming events, what's going on. But the most important one is the YouTube channel because at the YouTube channel, as we live stream events, we archive those events on that page for anyone to watch, union or not, across the country, across the world. Also, what we ask you to do is not tonight, but when you go home, you can watch that video. If you missed a note or something or didn't quite write something down, that's a great chance to rewatch it. But what we ask you guys to do and everyone online is to share those out. Because as much as we try to get the word out, we realize so many um, actors don't know about the foundation. And the more we get the word out, the more you guys help us with that, then the more people get educated and get the um, information they need for their career. Does that make sense? I um, hope you guys enjoy that feature. We work really hard to make that happen for you guys. So use it because it's there for you. That being said, we have a wonderful evening with rock star casting directors that have been in the business for so long and know so much and have some great stories to share with you. An excellent moderator. Give a hand to Steve Shigolin and we'll have him come on up. nervous? Yes. Um, and you introduced everybody. Uh, do, should I? Okay. Um, I just want to introduce the panel or the uh, participants here. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Um, John Popsidera. Is that Papsidera? Papsidera. Uh, nominated for Oz the Great and Powerful. Also did the uh, Dark Knight trilogy, Inception, and the new Wally Pfister film, Transcendence, I'm very curious about. Thank uh, you. Laura Kennedy in the middle. Um, yeah. Nominated for Argo. Uh, also did Cloud Atlas, Man of Steel, The Town, another film with Ben Affleck, and Siriano. Um, Denise Chamian, Chamian, Chamian uh, nominated for Pain and Gain, also did um, three of the Transformer movies, The Lone Ranger, Rum Diary, uh, and The Great Debaters, uh, really great film. Uh, Denzel Washington movie. And Ronnie Yeskel. Uh, nominated for the sessions. Also worked on a couple of Quentin Tarantino classics, Reservoir Dogs and Pulp Fiction, uh, Hope Floats, and the HBO series Curb Your Enthusiasm. So um, before we get into specifics, uh, maybe uh, one or all of you can indulge me and uh, let me know how you got into this profession, and whether there is a 
tried and true path or if it's something that it kind of happens in, in various different ways? Okay. I'll start. Um, I got into this profession kind of by accident. I started working at a theatrical agency and after a couple of years I knew that I did not want to be an agent. Uh, and I knew casting directors from talking to them on the phone and so I started working for one and it was kind of one thing led to another and that was the beginning and it was just kind of a really good fit for the, my interests and my personality. So. Okay. Um, I kind of did the same thing. I stumbled into a casting director's office going to lunch with another completely different side of the studio and she had a friend in the casting office so we went by and they were talking and I didn't didn't know her so I there was this big stack of mail sitting there which 30 years ago was submissions <laughs> and I said would you like me to open them all this mail for you while you guys talk and she said do you want to come here as an intern and so I said yeah that would be great and so I did <laughs> And then in two weeks, they fired the assistant and hired me because I was there. So that was it. Ruben Cannon and Associates. Me too. Really? Yeah. Oh my God. $200 a week? Uh, you, you were after me, so you maybe you, made 250 Yeah, maybe. Yeah. yeah. It was like 275 yeah. He was always the cheapest, he was the man, cheapest, cheapest the man alive. <laughs> yeah. Lovely. Like he would just throw you into the pit and go, yeah, just he would. do it. You yeah. can cast it. But cheap. <laughs> Keep, going. Yeah. Okay. Keep going down the line. Okay. Um, I uh, no, this is I just did not work you. for Ruben Cannon. Um, <laughs> the cheapest man alive. I um, I get letters uh, from Ruben now. Yeah. Wow. Sorry, Ruben. I uh, I went to uh, I went I studied as an actor. I went to graduate school and uh, and then I got out and knew that I had no. Uh, uh, ego to be an actor, and uh, and so um, after many years of uh, another career in doing uh, uh, in the restaurant business, I knew I didn't want to do that, and uh, and uh, and so I then started as an intern at the Taper and um, in theater, and then. Um, I won't say the line that I usually say. What do I say now? Um, I, I then worked for a lot of different people and uh, eventually partnered with somebody and then started my own company. And so that's the short version. There's a long one available online. There is. <laughs> Many inappropriate comments. I start, I didn't work for Ruben either. Uh, uh, I started in the theater and uh, in New York and then in DC actually and then I moved to New York and did lots of theater and uh, wanted to be an actor too but then decided that it wasn't for me and uh, thought I'd try casting and started working with some people and left them because they were insane and um, <laughs> and then went with another Bonnie Timmerman so <laughs> need we say more and um, and then Those are the things I left out of my comments. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and then went off on my own and have been doing it for a long time. <laughs> so, uh, John and Ronnie, given your backgrounds, I mean, how important is uh, an acting background or drama school or maybe even film school uh, to, to become a casting director? Um, to be a casting director? I, you know, it's interesting because... Um, I would then, because of training and, and studying with the people that I studied with, I would look at it through an actor's eyes and, you know, look at beats and look at moments. And, and, um, and I found it fascinating. People that I, that I worked for a lot of the times didn't. They just found the career. And, and, you know, I always thought, I don't know what they're looking at. And so, you know, it was a, it was a, it's a different perspective for me. But I, you know, I also think that, you know, by and large, it comes down to taste. And, um, and I think at the, in hindsight now, looking back, I think I had the same taste that I started as an intern at the taper than I do now. I don't think your taste changes necessarily. Um, and, um, and, you know, I try not let, you know, a lot of the people that I had started out with, I noticed a lot of their own personalities kind of 
influence their choices. I try and keep my personality out of it to some degree. I mean, you know, it's my show on some, on, on some level, but um, I also try and keep my personal opinions out of it and make it about the work. And, um, and you know, I, but I, I find it valuable that I had that background, um, but I think it, ultimately it comes down to taste and, and a, lot of, um, a lot of different skills, people skills at the end of the day. What about you, Ronnie? Um, because I was in New York and I was doing theater and I, I used to go to the theater every night and um, I find it essential. I mean, when I'm looking for actors, I really look for people who have trained in the theater because I know I can trust them. I know they know how to create a character, how to create a life for the character, how to use their body, how to use their voice. And, um, and given a script, they just know how to create a character, and that's what I look for, and I know I can trust it. Even, um, well, it's just, I love theater trained actors, and that's how I learned how to be a casting director, was just going to the theater every night, and it served me so well. So. Well, in the uh, 50s and 60s, uh, you know, uh, New York theater was, was, was the, uh, the breeding ground, that was the talent pool that uh, Hollywood drew from most often. Um, is that still the case today? And do we have uh, a, a similar uh, theater uh, well to draw from here in Los Angeles and maybe some cities in between? Go ahead, Laura. <laughs> I, think, I think nowadays we have to draw from absolutely every source that we have. So there's no one primary area. I mean, it used to be when we all started, probably there were three networks, maybe 120 movies released a year. And there was New York and London theater, really. And that was about it that you kind of kept tabs on. Now you've got to know who the top five actors or 10 actors are in Sweden. You got to know rappers. You got to know, you know, you have to know who has a web series, who has the most tweets. Uh, you have to know absolutely everything about media, pop culture, any, any artistic outlet, you kind of have to be able to tap into. It's not just theater. I mean, we all go to a lot of theater and we all see, you know, we're always in New York and London and, and seeing as much as we can here. Um, so it is a, it's a good source, you know, and it's an obvious source. They're sitting up there and they're doing you know, most nights you get to go in London or New York, you're watching a master class in acting. Right. So it's it's a great, it's a great, I would much rather do that than know who tweets the most. So <laughs> for me, I still go back to the well and back to the source. Mm -hmm. But in our jobs now, you have to be aware of absolutely everything. So music performers are fair game, because I would imagine, you know, everybody. they... Everybody. everybody, there isn't yeah. anybody who so global yeah. now that you just have to know. You, you can put somebody on tape in a day who lives halfway across the world and get their audition mm -hmm. that evening. You know, so it comes from every, every source possible. I think the that's why we're exhausted. <laughs> that's why we and nod scared. off. Just. <laughs> um. I think the common perception out there is that um, it's the director and the producer who cast the principal roles in, in film and television shows, and it's the casting directors who kind of fill in all those other sort of secondary characters. And I know it varies from project to project, but... Producers say, right? You're, you're yeah. really looking to wake us up now, yeah. aren't you? <laughs> yeah, no, fight me on this. I, 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 I want to know, um, uh, you know, in, in general, is that the situation, or does it vary from project to project? Oh, I'll be, I'll be I, I an mean, ass. it's almost never the um, situation. Yeah, it's never the situation. You know, um, uh, you know, I, I, I think I, we did a panel talking about the Academy Awards, and you know, my comment to the to the writer and the moderator was uh, the roundtable was, you know, before I was involved, there was no Batman before there was Batman, before I was there. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, that and Laura, I had the uh, privilege of working with Laura on, um, and, you know, it was, it was called from lists. It was called from screen test. It was, you know, there was no, oh, here are the stars. And somehow I look at my career and go, 
do I never get a movie with somebody attached? Yeah. You know, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's very rare um, that you get films, at least in my experience, with someone attached, you know. Um, but I, you know, I know that it's the very first thing directors and producers are apt to claim. You know, um, again, I told this story, I did a, a series for HBO, and, um, and I never usually look at DVDs and extras and stuff like that, I mean, after I've done something. And I happened to look at the, the DVD extras of it, and there they all were, I wasn't on the DVD extra, there they all were saying, oh, I knew it was her the moment I, she walked in, and I did this, and I, you didn't know that actor before I brought them in the room. And, and that's by and large, my experience of it. Yeah. So the fact that we get marginalized into a position of, oh, we're doing day players. Right. Yeah, we do that as well as everything else. Uh, yeah. And, and, and yeah, go ahead. But even Denise. if some, I, I do a lot of movies where one person is attached to it. Lucky um, you. And, <laughs> and even if they are, does that negate you, the rest of the movie? It doesn't, yeah. because you still have to find the female lead or the male lead and all the other leads around them and then all the other speaking roles. So it is almost never the director or the producer. You, we have free reign to make the list, put our ideas forth, and also communicate our opinions about those actors mm -hmm. and our point of view on who is best for the role. And we, I feel, greatly influence our directors and producers, if not by our passion and our knowledge, then also by the weight of our resumes as well. Yes. So And our relationships you know, with them. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And I would so. say most of the time for us that work with pretty, you know, I would say seasoned or, you know, one or, well, directors that know what they're doing, <laughs> then we make those decisions. And we inform the producer and the studio to say, in terms of an approval, this is who we would like. And then everybody then signs off on that. But it's very rarely the producer just making those decisions. It's the director and us. I, I work mostly in independent film. And I can spend close to a year trying to attach talent um, to get a movie financed. And they won't pay you. Oh, no, no, pay. no she gets they'll no pay. pay for that. They'll pay, because I won't work for free anymore. But I have. I have worked on plenty of movies for free, because I'm passionate about them. But it, it takes a lot of work to cast an independent feature that nobody is attached to. Mm -hmm. and, um, and you have to turn on. And I work with a lot of first-time directors, too. They turn out to be sometimes Quentin yeah. Tarantino and um, other people, but and and um, Ben Lewin, who just did the sessions, and that took almost a year to cast. You know, because we went through the names, and nobody even probably read it because it was a low-budget independent. And then one day I'm sitting there thinking, and I went, "Oh my God, it's John Hawks," and it turned out to be John Hawks, who was brilliant in it. But, um, you know, it's just very difficult to get agents to help you when there's no money. And uh, it just mm -hmm. takes a lot of time, huh? Mm -hmm. Are the days past when uh, people like Marion Doherty and Lynn Stallmaster held sway and, and uh, some fairly prominent uh, uh, positions in terms of influence uh, in, in who would get cast in a movie, uh, as we all might know, uh, Ms. Doherty was uh, head of casting at Paramount and then at Warner Brothers. Uh, at one point, uh, I, I saw this in a documentary recently, <laughs> casting by, um, she had one actor in mind for each role in The Sting other than uh, Redford and Newman. And they ended up pretty much going with all of her choices. Um, is, is that sort of the glory has passed, or uh, are, are there still people who have that kind of influence I, now? I think that still happens, depending on the director, the director you're working with and what your relationship is with him or her and how much they trust you. Mm -hmm. That can still happen. And then how much you know, influence they have with the studio. If it's a powerful director, then you can get then your you can do that. choices through. There are many times when I'll say, this is the perfect person, and the director I'm working with will say, yeah. Cur Perfect, love them, you know, it, it does happen. It does happen. There, it's just, 
overall, it's more difficult to get people cast now than it used to be. I'm, I'm wondering if uh, one by one you can tell us about the process uh, by which you uh, were involved in the, in the film that you're nominated uh, for an RDS award this year. You know, how did you get aboard? Um, uh, did you work most closely with the director, the producer, both? Um, you know, what's the first thing you did after reading the script? So it's a multi-question yeah. question. Um, sure. Well, with Pain and Gain, um, Michael and I had worked on uh, The Island together and so a few Transformer movies, and he was getting ready to do the fourth one. And he had me read the script about a year before called Pain and Gain. It was based on a true story of these bodybuilders who go on these crazy robbing, murdering rampages in Florida. <laughs> and I read the script and I loved it. And I, I said, this is very funny and it's something that you should really do as a get out of the Transformers mold. And he wasn't going to do it. And I said, are you just gonna be known as the Transformers director the rest of your life? And he was like, ah. So <laughs> we did it and we, it was the most fun I've had in the longest time because it was just really the two of us deciding who we wanted for every role and reading people and getting those people cast. The studio pretty much left us alone because it was a $25 million budget and they didn't care. They couldn't believe that Michael Bay was only going to spend $25 million on a movie. So they pretty much left us alone and it was a great experience. Not exactly a small amount of money though, $25 million. Well, true. But for Michael, yeah, not two hundred million. <laughs> so, um, I had done the town with Ben, and then um, the script came up. He was looking for something because the town had been very successful and then did very well for the studio. And the studio wanted him back and wanted to get his next film. So he was reading a bunch of stuff, and they had unearthed this project that George Clooney had had and had just been sitting there and he took a look at it and all of a sudden we were like full speed ahead. So with Ben attached and it wasn't a huge budget and we had had such success with the casting before they kind of left us alone on this one as well. And we didn't really want big, big stars. I mean, John Goodman is a big star and so is, is Alan Arkin, but they just didn't want to over saturate the film with that. They wanted it to kind of play as, as, as real as we could. So, you know, Ben and I just had the challenge of finding the other 130 people in the movie. So um, that was a huge, and the studio had, and no one else cared. They were just like, just make sure it's good. And we're like, okay. <laughs> and so we didn't have any involvement. It was Ben and I just chopping away at it every day, every day, every day. So um, that was, it was actually a great experience because we had the freedom to do, and we were, we were in the community that had embraced us with the Persian community here, and people were so forthcoming with these amazing stories, these life experience stories, and it was a remarkable journey, and both Ben and I just every day would pinch ourselves and think we are so lucky because it was a fascinating thing to go through together, so it was great. Um, on Oz, uh, sorry, on Oz, uh, I worked with Sam uh, and his wife on a couple of projects that did drag me to hell with Sam, and uh, uh, and so Sam works in a very different way than a lot of people. Um, he he's very collaborative. He likes to take a lot of input on um, on people, and I think the process. A lot of people were involved. I mean, his producer Grant Curtis was involved, Joe Roth was involved, the studio was involved. But really, when it came down to it, they all kind of defer to Sam and, um, and show him a lot of respect and a lot of leeway. And so, um, but you know, in, in dealing with Oz, it was also, you know, when I first read the script, I was like, you know, it's kind of the holy grail. I mean, I still look at the, the original Wizard of Oz and I cry, you know, the, the, when the scarecrow leaves. And, um, uh, and, um, and so it was a little bit like, oh, do, how do we touch this? And how do we not disrespect it? And how do we, you know, uh, there was a lot of conversations about that. And, um, and I think even as actors, you know, it was trying to find people that was, was very much like when we cast Heath in, um, 
in Batman, in Dark Knight, um, you know, a lot of actors didn't want to touch the Jack Nicholson role, you know, and what was in the, the um, lexicon of, of films. Um, a lot of the actors didn't want to touch Wizard of Oz. So it was really about how to go about that and be respectful of the original material, yet create something new. Um, and, um, and it was a process, but, you know, working with Sam was always creative and, um, and fun. You know, it was, it was a really great film to do, work on. Um, I was a, a juror at the Topanga Film Festival when I ran into a, an old friend of mine, Steve Nemeth, who, um, who handed me um, the sessions. And the director, Ben Lewin, is Australian. So he, you know, really didn't know anybody. We didn't have any. He had private financing, which was 600000 And um, that's what we made the movie for. But it took, it took close to nine or 10 months. Nobody was attached. Again, I, as I told you, that we went through about nine big names, and nobody came back to us. And then John read it and loved it and came on. And then um, um, we went through a lot of women. And, and, uh, and then Helen Hunt came on and was fabulous. And, and then we just, it was just the two of us, Ben and I, casting the movie. We didn't have a studio, and uh, nobody bothered us. And we just had a, a great time putting this film together. Speaking of John Hawks, uh, he seemed to be very hot at the time that he made that film. Uh, he seemed to be in everything at, at, at that time. Uh, and we've gone through years where you know certain actors seem to be all over the place. It's Jessica Chastain a couple of years ago. This year it's uh, Benedict Cumberbatch and Daniel Bruhl. Um, are these hot streaks purely coincidental, or um, do filmmakers sense you know they want to cast the the newest, biggest thing in their movie and sort of strike while the iron is hot? I think John Hawks is not the biggest thing that, you know, he can't get a big movie financed, but he's one of the most brilliant actors that ever lived. He's a chameleon. He just changes form every time he takes on a role, but he's not financially viable. Um, and uh, I just put an offer out to him for something else that I think is just a, a brilliant script. And um, I'm hoping and praying that he takes it. Um, but I, I think it goes in waves, mm -hmm. don't you? That, uh, I think, you know, everybody knows what's in front of them. Mm -hmm. And you, you see Benedict and you go, oh, well, let's put Benedict in this. And so all of a sudden, Benedict becomes a leading man by just a series of decisions that have been made. And, mm -hmm. then, and then that'll change at some point. I mean, Daniel Brühl's been around since, what, Goodbye Lenin, mm -hmm. which was so mm -hmm. many years ago, and we all knew who he was. But he just happened to get two movies that came out right in a row. Mm. And same with Benedict. I mean, I mean, seen Benedict in stage for years before somebody took a chance on him. And so now it's just a question of you, they get one role and then they get another and then they get hot and then you want that hotness in your film so you can get financed. It's just, it just kind of goes and it'll be somebody else and then somebody else and it's a wave. And you shouldn't take your hotness seriously either. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. What, what, was, was Mr. Hawks the biggest coup for uh, the sessions? I'm sorry, I missed that. Uh, was, was, was casting Mr. Hawks the biggest coup for the sessions? And, and, and this is a question first, for the rest of you. It was the first. I mean, he, after nine months of going out to, you know, James McAvoy and all the other people that we went out to, I called John because I've known him for 23 years and mm. said, I have a script for you and then called his agent and then his manager, but I called John. Mm. So when John said yes, it was like the earth opened up on me because we were working so long and so hard on this movie to get somebody attached. And then once John came on, then it was so much easier because everybody wants to work with him because he's so good. What about on Argo? Was there any particular uh, actor that you felt like, wow, this, this is perfect. I didn't think we, we'd be able to get this person. Well, I uh, think getting John, better than I thought. John and Brian oh. and, and Alan. Because 
you know, you read the script and you think, who's going to play this? And you can actually hear Alan, as you're reading it, say those lines. There's nobody but Alan Arkin. Mm -hmm. So I think getting Alan in the film and then getting John's energy and Cranston at that moment in that time, you know, after the fifth season, I guess, fourth, fifth season of Breaking Bad. I mean, the three of them just really, and having been rooted that movie, you yeah. know, and then we had to get, then, you know, then you start with the house guests in it, but getting those three guys, those are our three guys, mm -hmm. and that felt, that was our foundation. Is there a point where a, an actor seems overexposed? Uh, one might make the argument about James Franco being uh, somewhat overexposed. If, if, if you were to John cast... John did that to him. If, <laughs> if, if you were to cast Oz, uh, you know, today, would you look at that role differently, or uh, would um, you do the same thing? Yeah, again, it was a lot of different people. I mean, Disney had the, uh, the project. Um, Sam, when I first read the script, asked me, you know, who do you see, who do you think? Um, there was a list of guys that we, you know, uh, talked about. Um, some gettable, some not. Some uh, were attached and then became unattached. And um, and so, you know, it was a it was a process. Um, I've known James for years, and you know, the question was, could James be charming and be funny and you know have a lot of different facets to it? And um, getting everybody on the same page as that, um, you know changed, uh, you know, daily almost. Mm. Um, but I think that, um, I think that, you know, it was a younger version than what they initially thought. And that seemed right to try and expose it to a new generation of people. And, um, and you know, you start going down that list and there's very few people that a studio will say, yeah, okay, we're going to put him at the centerpiece yeah. of it. So um, I don't know how much it would change. I mean, sure, mm -hmm. there's always somebody else. I think that, um, you know, part of my job is to uh, have an opinion, but you also, also always have to have somebody else in mind um, because it's not my film. At the end of the day, yeah. it's the director's film and the studio's money and, mm -hmm. you know, a producer's project. So, um, you know, I think there's always somebody else, but I thought James, uh, you know, was the right person at that time. I know filmmakers never want to discuss who else was up for a particular role, but uh, can you mention one or two actors who were vying for that role? Well, I mean, it's more, you know, it's not even producers or directors, I think on some level, it's, it's more the actor doesn't necessarily want to hear yeah. that. And I try and, you know, be um, respectful of that. Um, but, you know, certainly, you know, Robert Downey Jr. was, you know, loosely going to mm -hmm. do the film, and then that didn't happen for a while, um, and I'll say that because it was public, but um, his schedule didn't allow with Iron Man and a lot of other things, yeah. and, you know, at that point, you know, the studio panics, okay, where mm -hmm. do we go then, and, um, and, you know, a lot of those other guys, the Clooney's of the world and people like that, either busy, not right, uh, yeah. so, um, uh, you know, there was a variety of people, but really, the, Robert was attached to the movie mm -hmm. initially, and then, um, and then it didn't come come to happen. Now there are directors like uh, Woody Allen who are happy to turn over the reins uh, to their casting directors, in his case Juliet Taylor. Um, there are other directors like Taylor Hackford, for example, who don't want to give credit to anybody else uh, and will, you know, say that they were the final say on everything except maybe the catering. Um, <laughs> do you find that um, there's this tremendous gulf between the former and the latter, or uh, have you been lucky and, and dealt with uh, true collaborators uh, throughout your career? I guess this would require naming names. I think not, like, maybe not through our entire career, but I think all of us up here now really wouldn't want to work with somebody who didn't value our input and our, what we bring to the table. It's like, I, I wouldn't want to do it. Mm -hmm. And so I had a situation at the studio and there was a director and I just said, you know what, I'm not going to do this movie. I'm yeah. going to find, we'll find you someone else. And, but when you have that opportunity or meet somebody who's brand new, who's this lovely man who you worked with, and, but at a certain point, we also tend to work with the same people now 
over and over again and with mm -hmm. Chris and with Michael and you know with Ben and you know that then you get into a rhythm and it's like to let somebody else into your space will take a lot yeah they have to prove themselves to us now at this point yeah you know John Christopher Nolan he's yeah. known as a fairly controlling guy <laughs> um, you've worked with him both as, as a director and a producer and, yeah. and many times both yeah um, was there a difference between working with him on, say, the Dark Knight movies and, and working on this Wally Pfister movie, Transcendence? Um, you know, I have, uh, I've been lucky enough to do uh, every one of, of Chris's movies, uh, except one. And, um, yeah, I don't want to talk about that. <laughs> <coughs> and, uh, and, you know, I have to say, on Memento, it was one of the, um, the easiest um, and most enjoyable casting jobs in that you, what you talked about earlier, that, that uh, the time where a casting director could bring in one person and mm -hmm. somebody says yes. Chris really gave me respect and, and the leeway to say, just bring in who, you know, uh, you want me to see. And, you know, it was, we cast that entire movie probably in three or four weeks after we, after the initial thing of who was going to be in it. I mean, initially it was going to be Brad Pitt in the Guy Pierce role and um, that fell apart. And so once Guy stepped in, it quickly went after that. Um, you know, Chris has, uh, I mean, one of the most brilliant uh, men I've ever met um, and has a better memory than anybody else on his sets. You know, any department head, any, you know, he'll quote things like, didn't we see him on, you know, the fur on Batman Begins? And I'm like, maybe we did. Uh, and, you know, and then, you know, and he'll be, oh, yeah, we did, we did. And um, so it's hard, uh, it's hard not to um, give him, you know, uh, a lot of credit in that. Um, and he certainly has become um, not more demanding, but more specific mm -hmm. about things as his, his um, knowledge of actors has grown over the years mm -hmm. and through all those films. Um, but, you know, the greatest uh, gift that a director, for me, can give you is that sense of trust. Mm -hmm. And um, the fact that, that Chris and I do have a trust amongst one another and between one another, um, and that he'll say, I don't, you know, I'll get a message back, let John decide, is, you know, is a huge, huge compliment. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that's what you work for, you know, throughout a career, at least I do, with directors. You want to gain their trust. I'm blessed that I get to work with a lot of directors, as Laura was saying, again and again. Same with producers. You know, I've done multiple, multiple projects with producers. To me, that's the greatest, you know, um, sense of accomplishment, accomplishment mm -hmm. to find like minds that you work with and that they get you and respect you and, and it's a two-way street. So um, uh, it's changed over the years with Chris, mm -hmm. but, um, but it's incredibly rewarding, and you know I'm honored to be respected by somebody that's that smart. You know, did he did he let go a little bit more on Transcendence? I don't know if you people are aware, but uh, Wally Pfister was uh, Oscar-winning cinematographer yeah. on on Transcendence, and and has basically shot all of uh, Christopher Nolan's films. Yeah. And this is his directorial debut, but it's a it's a big budget movie. Yeah. It's a couple of hundred million dollars. Yeah, it's a big stakes yeah. project. Yeah. Um, was the dynamic was the dynamic different with Fister uh, holding the reins uh, as a director? Yeah, I mean, I worked really closely with Wally in a lot, a long time to get that mm. movie going. I mean, you know, Ronnie was talking about how long you got to um, work on a project to actually see it come to to life, and um, and we worked for months and months and months. In fact, they burned through my entire deal just trying to get the movie up and going, and. Um, and so it was different. It was really Wally and I, and uh, and Alcon, the the uh, the studio that made the film, really for a lot of months in the trenches trying to figure out who and what and how those pieces were going to go together. Um, Chris and and Emma, his wife, who's a producer on the film as well, um, you know, they would be involved. It'd be much more, you know, from an, an arm's length. They were prepping. Um, uh, Interstellar, which we just finished, so they were busy on their own project as well, but we'd run things by them and talk to them about it. Um, but really it was Wally, you know, um, at the helm of that and making decisions and, and trying to fit the script, not only to fit Johnny Depp, but a lot of other people and, mm -hmm. and get all those pieces kind of together. Uh, another thing I learned in this documentary uh, casting by is that um, 
Marion Doherty fought very hard for Danny Glover to be in Lethal Weapon as, as, as Mel Gibson's police partner, even though the part was not written for a black actor. Um, and which brings me to a, a piece that ran in the LA Times today about um, a study, an Annenberg study that was done at USC about the lack of diversity in the top um, box office grossing films dating back, I don't know, five years or so. A sort of a woeful um, lack of, of representation of certain minorities. Is it, the, is it the casting directors, is it part of their job to ensure that that kind of diversity is reflected in, in movies when you're casting a film? I don't think it's our to some degree. degree. I, I mean, it depends on, yeah, we take it on though. I mean, mm. none of us make a list, it's all just one thing. If you're looking at a character, you're looking at the essence of the character. You know, it's not about color, right. it's about the character. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of us make our list just kind of all jumbled up. Mm -hmm. You know, it just depends. Yeah. Yeah. And you can't look at any any modern day world as just white male. You have yeah. to mix it up. I mean, that's the reflective of what society is today. So if you're making a realistic film, it's realistic to cast everything that yeah. you, you know, and bring dimensions to characters that you didn't think it could exist, you know, by mixing that up. I think all of us do that just as a rule. Yeah, but it might be one thing to believe that. It's another thing to exercise it. So, you know, how, how hard do you fight for that? But are you talking about a lead role or are you talking about supporting roles? Well, I'm because talking, well, I'm yeah, across uh, the board. I mean, uh, but, but, you know, uh, this study uh, involves speaking parts. So right. it wasn't just faces. It was uh, people yeah, who, yeah. who uh, were I real characters. I think you always try to, voices. and then ultimately the best person gets <clears throat> the role. You, you know, I mean... You, yeah. you I, look, I think there's a lot of people that are involved in that decision. You know, we can try and be, and I try um, to be as diverse as you can throughout the, the project and, and bring up those options. Um, but like Laura said, you're trying to fit a character. Mm -hmm. So yeah. really, you know, when those things, I, I kind of go back to, well, really talk to writers because they're the people they're the writing writers. the material, yeah. you know what I mean, on some level, and talk to the studios because those are the people about worried about, you know, sitting the seats or, you know, butts fitting in seat. butts in the seats and getting, you know, people into the theater. Mm. And, um, and so really those decisions start there. As right. a casting director, I mean, it was a very, it was a huge compliment. I did a movie called Ender's Game that's coming out and Variety actually reviewed it today saying there wasn't the typical just pretty young kids in the movie, but that it was yeah. a wide range of, of races and, and diversity. And, you know, I thought that was admirable that they even recognized that. Mm -hmm. um, but that came from an idea that we're looking at a world in the future and we're looking at, you know, placing these, also the source material, but placing people in the future that it's a very different world than yeah. what we live in today. So it was a directive out of the script to some degree and out of the project right. more so than it was me like, oh no, get the little, you know, uh, the, the little kid that's, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, of an ethnicity. You yeah. know what I mean? So I think it really is dictated somewhat before a casting director's involved and we just get mm -hmm. to enhance it on some level. Mm -hmm. But it's also like, everyone's responsibility. Mm -hmm. It's not just our responsibility or the studio's responsibility mm -hmm. or the writer's responsibility. If there is a Hispanic film that opens up on a weekend with Hispanic leads mm -hmm. and the Hispanic community doesn't turn out, there's not going to be another one. Yeah. And the same with anything, you know? So it's like, so they make yeah. a movie, My Big Fat Greek Wedding. Every woman went four or five times. Yeah. So it's like, so you make that movie then you've got to go see it, and you've got to support it, and you've got to support the actors and the filmmakers, and it's, it's all of us have to do that. It's just not, you can't sit back and go, well, they just don't make movies for women. Mm -hmm. Then go write one. Show mm -hmm. up when they do make one. Do you know what I mean? It's like, you have to assume the responsibility as well. It's not just us, so. Uh, let me just ask a couple of more questions, then I'll turn it over to the audience's questions. Uh, what about typecasting? Um, you do that uh, a lot, don't you, is, John? Is, love is, it. Is, <laughs> love it. <laughs> is, do you feel like it's, it's part of your duty to kind of push against that? Uh, you know, uh, Dustin Hoffman as Benjamin Braddock in The, in the Graduate is a perfect example of casting against type mm -hmm. and it working brilliantly. Um, 
do you try to avoid that? And, and can you give a ex specific example of, of an actor cast against type in one of the films that you've worked on where it really worked well? I don't think I, any of us want to yeah, cast like yeah. pigeonhole or type right. cast we, anybody. We always think, how how can we do this a little differently? Yes. How can we come at this differently? Yeah, and sometimes people are just perfect for a role because of the type they are and their personality. And mm -hmm. there are certain movies that want you to, to keep do to do that, and you have to know what you're casting. You have to know when you can go against type and with what, which roles you can do that with. I, yeah, I think casting, there are no rules for it. You know, yeah. you have to be open to different avenues, and that's when you're the most successful. Yeah, you know, and I also would say that I think, you know, that was a different time in the world. You know, um, the 70s, you know, brought about, you know, a lot of, I mean, amazing, amazing films. Those studios weren't run by people that are about marketing. They weren't run by people that are about publicity. And the yeah. film business has really changed. It is, it is commercial, it is right. marketing, it mm -hmm. is a lot of things that are not, that is not just a director telling a story, you know? And yeah. so it takes away, it limits you a lot, you know? I mean, you were talking earlier about actors and how do they, you know, get these waves. Well, they'll get the wave until their first movie or second movie comes out and it flops. Right. That wave's over. Yeah. And that is because of studios and marketing and how do they sell the film. And, you know, it's really, it's really about that yeah. these and, days. And it's a product. And even also, big stars, you see them go all of a sudden yeah. here and then they have a down. Right. And it's like, oh, well, then don't we get an Oscar. Don't, don't put, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, can't yeah. put them in that movie. And then they go back up again. They come back. It's like. And also, for instance, it, speaking about typecasting, you're not going to take. No offense to Jesse Eisenberg, but you're not going to put him in Fifty Shades of Grey. <laughs> you know, I mean, there is, there is, there is yeah. a time when typecasting works yeah. for its purpose. You and, right. Well, uh, speaking of Fifty Shades Although of Grey, I I'm, find you know, Jesse very mm. sexy. They, <laughs> they, <laughs> Jesse, if you're out there I, watching I, tonight oh, he's watching. from home. Oh, he's watching tonight. Yeah. I, I find him sexy too. I, you know, I, I, I appreciate a, a good brain. Um, but um, and you know, talking about uh, 60s and 70s, you know, it seems like you know in those days, you know, one of the uh, revolutions in casting was was going for that everyman look. Um, you know, actors seem to have gotten prettier over the years. Um, do you agree? Marketing. Or marketing. I think people are prettier. You know, I mean, yeah. I think. People take care of themselves yeah, more I mean, than they used to do. Uh, one more question, uh, hot button <laughs> issue. Um, uh, it's been argued that casting directors uh, uh, should be considered for um, Oscar uh, okay. recognition. Um, <laughs> as to uh, you know, music supervisors and, and title designers and maybe even stunt men and women. Um, and to get away from your own profession for a minute, I mean, if, if you could add to the list of people who get these awards, other than casting directors, who would you put on that list? I mean, I don't think we should be so stingy about a cat. Uh, anybody who contributes creatively mm -hmm. or significantly to the making of a film. Well, I right. love what the Emmys do is the Emmys have the creative Emmys. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so it gives them the ability to embrace all of the people that bring something to the success of a project. And the Academy has a limited amount of time. They do have a technical Academy Award, right. and but it hasn't really embraced kind of a little further down on the spectrum. Right. And, and I, I, I think the, the Emmys have done a great job right. with that. And also, the Emmys are a bigger, more diverse body mm -hmm. of people. The, the problem mm -hmm. with the Academy is they're much older. They're, they, they have, it's going to change now, because they have new leadership, and it's going to be, I think, much better, more inclusive. Mm -hmm. 
lovely Laura <laughs> Kennedy on the board. Like, things will change now, and I think they're going to invite more people to be members, which is very important. I mean, sometimes when I go to Academy events, like the foreign film, you know, events where you watch um, foreign films up for Academy Awards, literally the audience, is, I'm the youngest person there. Mm -hmm. And it, 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 that needs to change because, because they don't understand how casting guys, has yeah. changed. And but it's hard because at a certain point you have to have a certain standard by which then you can, you, you've achieved that ability. And so that's usually with age. And so that's also, it's, it's hard to say, you know, so you should be a member of the Academy but not have achieved really anything yet. So we, they've set a very high standard at the Academy. And so therefore it takes us a while to get there, yeah. which is, you know, and I do like that they have standards, but I think now what we've seen with our branch getting mm -hmm. included, and they have been incredibly welcoming and so supportive to us, it's been overwhelming. So I think it's, there's a new wave at the Academy, and I think it's exciting, and maybe we'll be the beneficiaries of that, and we'll see. It's, but we're just happy to, you know, at least have reached where yeah. we are at the moment. We're very happy. Let's open it up to the audience. Um, got a very good question here. Um, what was some of your favorite movies, what were some of your favorite movies to work on that maybe did not get critical acclaim? Any volunteers? <laughs> Oh, where do I start? <laughs> uh, uh, I, I think, um, you know, I, I look down my resume and go, well, what can I put on there? Um, and, uh, uh, and I think, look, I think, yeah, there are, there are a variety of things. I think it's also, you know, it's amazing to me that any film in this day and age comes out and does well because so many things have to happen, you know, um, and so many things are out of your control. You know, um, whether a 9-11 happens on your opening weekend or, you know, a, another tragedy in the world happens or a snowstorm or, you know, that's, that's out of a filmmaker's, you know, control. Um, and so I think it's, um, it's a hard thing to say. You know, I have to say, and I don't, I believe every film, I really stand behind the cast that I put in every film. I don't think I look at any film and go, Mm, yeah, I took that one off. Um, I, you know, and so it's hard for me to decide what is good or isn't. A film works or it doesn't work for a lot of different reasons. Um, but as, a, as looking at my participation in it, I don't think I've done a bad movie yet. But we're talking about the critics here. I yeah. Mean, what, what did the critics pan that you thought was unfair? Again, where do I start? <laughs> um, I would. Um, I, I'm a journalist. I always have to, you know, tell yeah. people to be yeah, specific. Yeah. 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 Um, just pick one. Just pick one. Just pick one. <laughs> just pick one. <laughs> mm. I'll pick one. Yeah. The Lone Ranger. Oh, okay. Right. You know, sir. I mean, I loved working on the movie. Mm, yeah. I thought it was a good way. The critics were brutal mm. to the point where no one went to go see the movie. Mm. And um, I thought we had a great cast, it was mm. fun, it was, you know, it delivered on a lot of different levels and it was just a huge bomb. So. Yeah, I mean, I'll say, I mean, White House Down, if I'm looking at, you know, re recent things, White House Down, you know, for a lot of different reasons, one, the other film, I've, uh, Olympus, has Olympus Has Fallen, fallen um, beat us to the market, you know, um, and I think people thought, oh, it's the same movie, I'm not gonna go see that again. Um, but, you know, I, I really, for, for that kind of popcorn movie, I thought it was really good. Roland did a great job. I think the cast was excellent. It's just weird, you know? I mean, there are certain things that people get on the bandwagon and, you know, run, journalists run down that road. It's a, I was listening to Rahm Emanuel today talk about um, Obama. Oh, look at me sandwiching things right in. Um, uh, and. And, you know, he was talking about journalists. And he said, look, it fits your narrative. Mm. You know what I mean? And so one journalist, you know, well, why didn't that movie work? Well, it must have been this and that. There's a groundswell of a narrative. And then people yeah. love to jump on it. Right. You know? Yeah, but Variety right. loves to do that, to yeah. create these narratives. Right. Uh, you know, Lone Ranger being an example, make or break film for Army Hammer. Right. Um, if, if we believe Variety, that movie proved that maybe he couldn't carry 
his weight somehow. So I just put him in a lead in a movie. Okay. But also, you know, but also, is not a star anymore. I mean, you can, but, yeah. but, and we're crucified before we even yeah. start. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, casting Ben Affleck as Batman. I mean, for God's oh, sakes, yeah. we haven't even made the movie yet, and he's been hung out to dry. And why? Let us make the movie. Let us show you what we have in mind. Let him have a chance to star in the film and do what he knows he can do before people start damning it to, to fail. It's like, it's unbelievable. Too much talking. It is. Shut up. I think he's got an appropriately square jaw. Exactly. Um, this is a question from uh, somebody who's not anonymous, Carolina Benetti. Um, right there. Carolina. Thank you, Carolina. Carolina? Carolina. Carolina. What surprised you this past year creatively that you loved? And we would get away from our own work here for a minute. I'm just going to say, because I'm on the bandwagon about 12 years a slave. Okay. I think, it, I think it should be mandatory. I think it's essential. I think every, it should be in every school. It should be in every home. It's just the most powerful thing I've seen ever. You know, it's just one of those films that you all need to see. And then tell everybody you know to see it. I agree. Mud. Yeah, yeah, I, love mud. I, love mud. I, I yeah, to carry the theme of 12. I'd say short term 12. Mm -hmm. I thought it was a fantastic mm -hmm. movie, really well done um, and surprising. Love Larson. Yeah. 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 What'd you say? Denise? Do you go to movies? Yes, I do. <laughs> I just can't remember what I've seen. <laughs> surprised me I mean I, I I pretty much have liked everything that I've seen recently just for one reason or another giving everything a wide berth I don't know possibly White be, House Down I'm possibly. trying to, I yeah. love yeah. White House Down yeah. where to go Denise and I am not kidding that's okay I don't remember what I did last week um, <laughs> this is a question from Mark Cirillo Mark uh, for John Papsidera. Oh, well, and Laura. Okay. Are there specific challenges to casting a superhero role that make it more difficult than your general casting of characters? Is it always just a list of celebrity slash name actors? No. I mean, when we did the Heath thing, remember yeah. that lunch we had? Yeah. And that was, you know, we had gone through all different types of people. I mean, yeah. he certainly was the one that just everybody was like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, and I've, you know, I've gotten in trouble in the past by saying this, but uh, what the heck, I'll say it again. <laughs> um, that, um, you know, look, I think, um, I think the biggest thing, you know, and um, is there in superheroes, there's a heightened sense of reality. There's a heightened sense of who those characters are. And that, you know, especially with Batman, you know, um, there's a masculinity to it. And, you know, at one point I said to some journalist, Steve, um, <laughs> that, um, that um, they don't grow men like that in America much anymore. Mm. And, you know, and I said something about the feminization of, uh, yeah, of men in America. And, you know, I still stand by that. It's hard. You look at leading men that are American, and there are a lot of man boys, you know? And... Um, <laughs> And you know, and I, Pretty I boys. believe it's Pretty sorry? Boys. What? Pretty Boys. Pretty Boys. Yeah. And, um, but you know, there's a femininity to the American male, you know, and, on some level. And I think it's why, you know, films have looked to Australia, they've looked to other countries. They still grow men as men in Australia. And I think it's a, it's, it's a weird thing, but I think when you're in a dark room looking up at a screen, it's the same thing that John Wayne portrayed. It's the same thing that these larger than life characters, when a human being is in a dark room staring at, you want to be. And, and you transfer some kind of imagination to that character. So for me, I think you know, that's an essential part of an actor that can embody that bigger sense of a human being than necessarily what they are. I'll be in trouble again. <laughs> uh, from Magdalena Holland. Thank you. Thank you, Magdalena. Could you talk about what makes a great audition? A very good question for this audience. 
prepared. Oh. Pre preparation. Preparation. <laughs> My God. Fearlessness. Being off book, preparing your character, just being focused. I can't stress that enough. It's the worst when people come in and they're fumbling through their sides. That you should take every opportunity as your last opportunity to ever audition for something and take it very seriously. Because it's never about that audition. Right? <clears throat> it's about the next audition. Right. Because with us, we're going to see a bunch of actors. And we're going to need to bring in actors all the time. And people who show up and do well by us. Yeah. And present, like, we're presenting you as a choice. And the director's like, you, but you don't get chosen. We're going to bring you in until someday yeah, you get chosen. We're going to try you again We're going to keep trying. So. Mm -hmm. And so it's always about that next audition. And the ability, I think, to walk out of that room, know you did your best, and then let it go. It's taking chances. It's being confident in what you're doing and, um, and the character that you're portraying, but going in there and feeling strong and fearless, which is very exciting to watch. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I would say it was about choices. You know, I, I see so many actors come in and not really make strong choices. And, you know, and, and cho that being said, choices don't mean or being fearless doesn't mean, oh, I get to go crazy. You know, um, uh, it's not about being outside the realm of what that character is, you know, but it, it does mean making smart choices and choices that maybe not every other actor walks in. I'll, I'll tell a quick story and then I'll be quiet. Um, that I was working on a project and we saw every girl, it's ages ago, every girl in the world and um, for this movie, it was a John Goodman movie about uh, Huey Long. And um, a lot of girls read for it. And the scene called for um, his secretary to be taking notes. And every girl that came in had either a pen or a pad and sat there and made notes and, or mimed making notes. And Anne Hayes, who got the job, came in. And her choice was to sit there and just listen to John Goodman give notes. And her, her assumption was, as this character, I'm smart enough to remember everything. She got up and walked out of the room to go type the letter. And I still kind of get chills by it because that was an actor, you know, I feel privileged to be in the room when an actor, when I'm in the presence of an artist. And to me, that is a, that's a moment when somebody is really owning it, making a smart choice, looking at something different within the text and creating something that not everybody else walks in with, you know? Because you're not gonna get a lot usually. No. I mean, these days, very rarely are you going to get, especially on the superhero movie, you're never going to mm. get a script. You're mm. going to get sides. Mm -hmm. So out of that side, and we all try to give something that's complete enough that you can make something out of that. Mm -hmm. That's your job, is bring that to us. And so you've got to make something out of nothing, usually, which is hard, I know. But it can be done. And when it's done, mm -hmm. it's clear. I want to know why you don't give a script out. <laughs> because things like what happened with Ben's announcement, mm -hmm. they get a hold of the yeah. script and they tear it apart yeah. before we get a chance to make yeah, the it movie. It goes on the internet That's immediately. Why. That's why. Yeah. There's no protection anymore. anymore. Yeah. That's why. I would imagine uh, that they would have to come in under the assumption that they've got one shot. Uh, but, you know, there's been situations where someone has blown the first audition and yet came back and nailed it somehow. Well, I've brought people back many times to work with them, redo the audition, give them notes. I mean, if you believe in somebody, then mm. I don't think you find any of a us way do it. Just like come in, let you do it once, and then say thank you. Yeah. We're there to work. Right. We're there to try to find the right actor to breathe life into this character. So I'm not going to like not give you your chance, even if somebody is off the mark. I try to give direction. See if they'll take it and do it at least another time so I can see if there's a response, a call and response. Mm -hmm. Always. I think all of us do yeah. that. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the, um, you know, uh, because I, I certainly see a lot, of, a lot of people and I see a lot of people the, over and over again, you know, and it, it means that I'm a fan of theirs. It means that I like their work. And I remember one day somebody said, oh, I'm going to come in this office once and get a job. And I was horrified. You know, I was horrified by the fact that their perception was, I'm not hiring them. 
and all I can do is present the opportunity. You know, all I can do is be a fan of actors, which is what I love about being a casting director. You know, I always, from the day that I know somebody to the day that I die, I can be a fan of that actor's work. It doesn't have to do with if they make me money. It doesn't have to do if they're hot in their career or not. I can respect an actor. You can never hire them. You'll That's never right. be able to hire them. Right. And you still bring them in. That's right. And you still and you will still fight and give them an opportunity. Right. That's all we can do. All you can do. This is a question from uh, Andrew Alden for Ronnie. When you cast different talent, do you ever stray away from your original vision of the actor? If you think that they could also fit the criteria for the role. I'm sorry, get that to me again. Uh, do you ever stray away from your original vision uh, oh, for a part? Uh, all the time. That's you know, casting out of the box. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm totally open to looking different avenues for, um, for actors. How, how much does physicality come into it? I mean, or, or do you have a uh, preconception of what this character will look like? Um, and will that uh, dictate your, your decision making? Maybe not your decision making, but I mean, where you start. You have to have some concept so before you start. I mean, there is a script and a yeah. blueprint, and then you know, and then mm. you try to go around it, and you mm. try to see what works. And people come in and surprise you, and it's you know, 180 degrees from what you thought it would be. And yeah. You know, a perfect example is when we were doing the sessions, and I don't know if you know what the movie, the actor who plays the movie is in an iron lung, mm -hmm. and. Um, John Hawks was known for Winter's Bone and um, for Mary, Marcy, whatever. I mean, really difficult roles. And my director didn't know him, and he you know, looked at him and said, oh my god, that guy, he's so creepy. <laughs> and then he met him and, and uh, fell in love with him. And John, I think, was against type of what mm. we were looking for for that role. Yeah. Wonderful movie, and, and all the secondary parts uh, were, were fantastic, Thank too. You. Uh, Thank actors you. Actors who I hadn't seen prior to that film. A lot of people from, the, again, the theater. But when we cast that movie, we were casting for diversity as well. Uh -huh. So we cast a lot of, um, it was mostly diversified. And, and I forgot to mention that Helen Hunt and Bill Macy were so crucial to this movie that, um, um, to get it made. I'd never seen a priest with that kind of hair. Was that, uh, was that his? That's his hair. Yeah, that's his hair? I mean, that's how he okay. wears it all. Um, what makes you say yes to a script? Or if you work with a certain director, it doesn't matter what the script is, you're going to work with that director? What's the deal there? For me, I love character-driven material. That's, um, that's got great... It's got great characters in them. It's, it's very exciting to work on material like that for me. Anybody else? Uh, you know, I, um, I, uh, I think I have to have some connection to it. You know, I, I don't know that it's an intellectual process as much as it is some visceral response, whether this works in that genre, this is people I like, these mm -hmm. are producers that I care about. I mean, a lot of those decisions for me do come down to, because I work with the same people again and again, um, trying to help my friends get their movies made, you yeah. know, uh, on some level. Um, but then there is always like, you know, we have to work so hard in getting things done. Um, I try and believe in the movie that I or the project that I'm working on mm -hmm. because you got to go out there and sell it to agents. You got to convince managers why their clients should be in it. You have to, you know, convince actors why they should do it for no money. Like it's a it's a lot of of a battle yeah. if you don't really believe in what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. For me, it's too tough to do. Yeah, yeah you know, um, I don't know how to do that. You know, right? Um, but you know, uh, you know, I'm the guy that passed on. Uh, um, what was that thing? American, uh, you know, the kids and the beer and the, you know, American Pie. Thank you. So, I mean, don't ask me. I read it and went, what? Are you kidding? I can understand. And, I would have passed on it. Right. And then I went into a meeting one time and I said that line and one of the producers afterwards, I got the job and the producer afterwards said, 
in spite of the fact that you threw my movie under the bus, <laughs> I'm hiring you. I think there are many reasons why you decide to do it. It's not anyone. If it were just artistic, yeah. we wouldn't work. I'd be starving. <laughs> Honestly, it, yeah, there are a lot. And sometimes, like, I had to go meet on something recently that was a number five of movies that I had already done, and my heart was not in it. I didn't want to do the movie, but it was a producer that I work with all the time. And I gave the worst audition ever. <laughs> I, no, I was terrible because I, I read the script and I couldn't, I didn't want to cast another pirate and I didn't want to, I just didn't want to do it yeah. and I shouldn't have gone but I couldn't I couldn't say no to the and so I went and then I didn't get the job anyway and so I was like really like oh why did I do this I don't know so what, I have, have a question for you guys yeah. what happens when you have worked with somebody and they give you a terrible script and I know oh, I, I lost a relationship with somebody one time because I didn't want to do their movie. Good question. Yeah, I mean, it's tough. I, it's yeah, about loyalty I that I. Yeah, you, mm -hmm. you. Most times you do it, I guess, or unless sometimes it, it, you have to say you're not available. In some way. That's what you have to say, Ron. Right? Yeah. Yeah. That's what? You're not I'm not available. Yeah. Yes, no, I know. You can't I, tell yeah, the truth. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, but, you can't. Oh, oh okay. Ah. Uh, Hmm. Just being honest. <laughs> it, it is about relationships, though, isn't it? I mean, you know, uh, yeah. it, it, uh, filmmakers get comfortable with, with certain collaborators, and they want to work with them repeatedly. And, and I would imagine that uh, um, if you've got some competing uh, offer, then you must be torn uh, sometimes. Uh, it's hard. Between the person that uh, really just feels like you're on their team always, and... Uh, this other project that might uh, uh, provide a challenge that uh, is very exciting. You know, when I, uh, to speak to that a little bit, when I work with Gore Verbinski all the time, and when we started doing, when he talked to me about doing Rango, this animated feature, and ex I went, oh God, what is, <laughs> like honestly, I said, why don't you, you should call Ruth Lambert <laughs> because she knows how to do Anna. I don't know how to do this. And he goes, well, neither do I. I go, but I don't even understand what you're trying to do. So, and he said, you know what? We're just going to go on this adventure together. Just we'll experiment. We'll do whatever. And it ended up being one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life. And one of the most rewarding things that I've ever done. So, you know, we just kind of, dove in and took a chance, even though I didn't, you know, understand. I mean, if you're lucky enough to have your accounts all come together at once, then mm -hmm. you're very fortunate, and you find a way to make it all work. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, yes. if it's something stuff that you want to do, you just kind of have to find a way and pray that they all are, you know, kind of not stacked yeah. up. But I think it's also, like, who we are as human beings. You know what I mean? Like, I, at least for me, I find it difficult to say no to people. You know, as a human being, I find it, you know, um, I'm working on it. But, um, but that, you know, I, I've done plenty of things that I feel like my friend wants me to do it. You know, I take it personal and, and you it's also, uh, yeah, but I also think that taking it personally is what also gives me passion and why I'm yeah, good, good at, at, at putting up the fight for them. Because it is personal to me. It's not just a paycheck. Mm. You know, I don't and know. If you how say to no to something, you might not get another shot. Maybe. Right. Yeah, you might not. Yeah. All right. This was early in my yeah. career, yeah. and it was, um, and I realized afterwards that I made a big mistake. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe it's not personal. It shouldn't be a betrayal. It should be business. I, I told you, I'm they working on the it. Do you believe it? Get off my back, will you? <laughs> um, I want to follow up on, uh, you were mentioning Rango, and, and uh, uh, I was thinking about uh, actors who were providing voices where you don't see them. Um, I saw a film last night called Her, uh, and I thought that Scarlett Johansson gave the best performance of her career, despite the fact that you never see her. Um, how often do you 
uh, come across these sorts of things where it's really all about the voice and um, you know and, and, and that ability to project drama and feeling and depth and emotion isolated from the physical person. Well, have I, you have, I never have, a lot have of experience except in that? for I mean we've worked on that one. happy happy feet and happy feet too. We've done a few things at Warner's, <laughs> so we have done them. I mean you just have to, I mean, when we do them, I mean, my associate, Christy Carlson, did those movies, but in helping and work on those, you just, you have to close your eyes. Yeah. Yeah. You That's can't, key. Why, you can't look at anything. You just have to sit and imagine with your eyes closed. All right. We, we, when we started, I, did, I called Ruth, and I, I called Leslie, and I said, okay, you guys have to tell me, like, how do I do this? And Leslie said, the main thing is you you cannot watch the actor. You have to close your eyes. And so I told Gore this. I said, Leslie says we cannot watch the actor. So what do we do? We have our first cast. We go through lists of people. He goes, I love this guy. I love that guy. And I'm thinking, oh my god, we're almost cast. This is amazing. So people come in and. Then he hears it after, and he loves all the actors, but then he hears it afterwards, and he goes, this is all wrong. Everyone is wrong for this. And I'm like, what do you mean? And he goes, we, we have to start over. And I'm like, we have to close our eyes. That's what I said. So after that, we just, I just put everybody on tape with the lens cap on, and we got the movie cast. It was a totally different experience. So, But I don't think in the, in the features that we do, that's not not Unless it's animation, like I don't know that that comes into play. You're, what you're talking about yeah. is a voiceover, so mm -hmm. that's right. totally different. Uh, this is a question from Wednesday Ryan. Um, if you were not a successful casting director, what occupational road do you think you would have traveled? I like the way you stated that. <laughs> okay. So many. <laughs> Hairstylist, <laughs> gardener, and chef. Chef. Chef, here, here. Chef. That sounds good. Goat yeah. farmer. <laughs> Shepherd. <laughs> yeah, chef. Something earthy. away. Earthy. <laughs> yeah. Away, from, away people. from people. <laughs> <laughs> Goats are good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Is it what we could have done or what we would have liked to have yeah. done? <laughs> what I would have liked to have done. Race car driver? Not race car driver. Um, uh, architect, if I had math skills, but I had absolutely none. And none. Um, uh, but I, you know, I don't, I, I have an imaginary picture of myself like in an exterminator truck in Florida somehow. <laughs> I, I don't know why, but you know, I do. But uh, you know, I probably, I mean, I own a restaurant now, but I'd, I'd probably be in the restaurant business, I guess. You know, the waffle, Hollywood. Anyway, it's like, really good. Um, <laughs> ER nurse, um, maybe special effects. <laughs> Show off, Ronnie. <laughs> <laughs> Something with my hands. Do we have time for one more? Um, this is from George Loomis for John. Um, how is it that you balance your socially important films with your big block blockbuster slash fantasy work? Uh, uh, and uh, is that a conscious decision uh, when you sign on to the next what was job? That last socially conscious. Movie? It's, all, it's all about balance. I don't think anything is a conscious decision. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, Did I mention this I'd was have from to George be Lynch? conscious to make a conscious yeah, decision. Right. Um, you know, look, I I I love working in independence in independence. I like doing studio movies. Um, you know, actually, it's much more fun even though it's harder work, to, um, to work on small independent films. You know, uh, they take longer, you gotta battle harder. A lot when you do studio films or big, big movies, it's a lot about, you know, I, I give Chris a hard time, um, Nolan, in that it's like, okay, who do you want? You know, it, it turns into that on some level because a certain director can, you know, 
get a lot of people. So it's then about list making, it's about making offers, it's a, it's a different process. It's not about bringing actors in the room and see what they create, which you get to do on smaller films and, and, uh, and so it's a different thing. But, you know, I, um, I just try and pick things that I respond to, that I have, you know, like I said earlier, some kind of visceral response to. Yeah. Last question from Lean Ritchie for Laura. Thanks, Lean. Um, I can't read with my. <laughs> see, I put them on because I wanted to see all of you out there. What advice could you give a young actor who is in the room with you for the first time? And you kind of touched upon this before, but uh, maybe you can expand a little bit. Yeah, I mean, what we had talked about before, and I think just to be yourself mm -hmm. and not to try to... Ass we don't know what we want either, okay? So for you to try to guess what we want and then betray that, it's not going to work. Mm -hmm. So just come in and be yourself and be as honest as you can and as sincere as you can. That's the best thing you can do. Mm -hmm really is. Don't try to second guess what you think we want, because we don't know. <laughs> okay? Well, thank you to all of you for taking the time to uh, appreciate you showing up. Thank you.